All right, so welcome to this new this seminar today. In today's seminar, it's a pleasure, it's our pleasure to have Artem Slavitz. He's usually at Kent State University, although he is right now physically in Paris. And he's going to talk about some set estimates in convex geometry. So whenever you want, Artem. Very good. Thank you so much for your invitation. And again, the only bad thing that I done that I needed to visit face to face, and I should do. So let me start talking about uh, some sets and in convex geometry. We will start a bit slow as we should. So everything objects that I will talk about will be convex. They, everything will be convex, and usually they will be extremely nice. So they will be definitely compact. And even they will usually be so-called bodies, so they will have non-empty interiors, or they will be a bit fat, as one can say. Okay, like absolute value, I will usually denote the volume. I will put this little symbol n to say that it's n-dimensional volume, but I will actually not put it if it's clear. You know, if we will measure the length, then I'll probably put the uh, symbol one to make it clear which dimension I use, but usually so just a very, very informal absolute value means volume or area and logically it will be very understandable. So the whole story is about Minkowski sum and this is a very, very nice, very classical object used a lot in number theory, analysis, geometry, all over the place and it defined in a very simple way. You take two objects, K and L, you take X in K, you take Y in L and you add them up. And addition is just simple vector addition. So for example, if you take those two segments, if they say of equal length, then it's quite easy to check, just literally to check that their sum is a square. If they're of different lengths, it's rectangle, or if they're not so perpendicular, you can get a parallelogram. Or for example, if you add a square and a triangle, you can get such a beauty. So this is a bit, gamble with combinatorics but it's not hard to check it too so i mean to get a feeling of this minkowski sum one need just as a child to play with this uh to get a bit more feeling why it's cool and why it's so applicable uh let's do something a bit more advanced and let's take this a square and add to it a circle just a circle you can imagine this circle to be of a very small radius also here i added it I don't know, radius one. And so what's happened, you kind of take a circle here and you move it all, all along sides of the square and you get such a beautiful picture. I don't know how precise it is. I still done it with a pen, but still it's a picture that you get by this addition. So, I mean, let, let me do it again. So here a rectangle, a non rectangle here, Paul, Polytop, um, polygon, I should say, because I'm in dimension two, and I add to it a circle. And you can see the following picture what happens that kind of here, you more or less move sides to distance t. So you prolong them to distance t like this. So that's what's happened. That's a picture. And I mean, it's a good question why it's interesting. So, what's so cute in this picture? Because now you can do computations. If you cal calculate just area of this guy, you will get that it's an area of K. You can see it literally here, area of K. Here it is, here area of K, plus boundary of K, those rectangles. Here you can see them, those rectangles, uh, multiplied by T because this height here is exactly T. So this is very simple. Plus, you know, those errors, here those errors. And you know what, I actually, I mean, one can start computing them precisely and those are very interesting things, but who cares about them? What I care about is this is error, you know, when T changes, it's a part of a circle. So it's in some way behaves like T square. And what is it precisely? I don't care right now. Why I'm showing it to you? Because immediately what you see is that if you play with this formula, if you take a limit, just by playing, I mean, literally move it here, and uh, sorry, literally move area of K here, write the difference, here's the difference, and divide by T, here T cancels out, here you're left with T times error, so it goes to zero, and you get the idea how Minkowski introduced the surface area. So this is a Minkowski formula 
for surface area. Very useful formula for surface area. Why I'm telling it to you, you will see in a second, but it, it's nice just to know. And this is one of the kind of in geometry way to use the Minkowski sum. Very good. And you see, I denote Euclidean, I forgot to tell you that's like this. I denote Euclidean ball of radius one, but I do it in a very, very functional analysis way. So it's a, a, a unit ball of uh, L2 in N dimensional space. So, I mean, again, this is very clear what it is. Okay, so now let's move a bit forward. So we all know that volume, we learn it in school. If you multiply uh, by non-negative number, then it jumps out of the volume in a power N. So the volume is homogeneous measure of degree N. So we also know that if you multiply it by a matrix, it jumps like determinant. We know many, many things, but that's I'm not so worried about right now. So that's what I'm worried about. So what I want to tell you, and some of you know it very well, that there is actually much more. So there is an absolutely amazing fact absolutely amazing, beautiful facts. That if you take K1, K2, KRB convex, so this is essential for me. They should be convex, otherwise it will not work so smoothly. If you take convex sets, it, they're not necessary to be bodies. They don't need to have a fat, so it's kind of a bit of error, So, but it works for bodies too. So if you take convex bodies, if you multiply them by non-negative number, but am amazingly, you'll get a polynomial. So not only you get a polynomial with one body like this, this is clear, but you get a polynomial if you mix and match them in any way you want. And the co coefficients of this polynomial, so here poly our polynomial, so yes, it's a homogeneous polynomial of degree and, I, and so on, and its coefficients are very special guys. They're very, very special guys. The so-called mixed volume volumes. And I mean, this is an extremely, extremely useful theorem. It's you, you need to prove it, you need to work it out in some way, some ideology of how to approach a theorem. I was showing you with this area formula, but this is, I mean, baby steps towards this absolutely beautiful and essential result in mathematics so in convex geometry, but I will show to you how it's used in some other place. Very good. So they have millions of properties, very easy properties and very hard properties. So let me just list some of them because otherwise, I mean, I will not be able to use all of them because otherwise it may become very, very long and not so interesting lecture. But what is clear, if I substitute all convex body to be just the same body, you get volume of K. It's clear that it's symmetric. Clearly, I mean, addition here, would change you know much, so it's in their arguments. It's also clear here you need to play just a bit that they're linear. I mean, you should call it multilinear, yes? So with each argument, they behave linearly. It's also, I mean, clear in some ways that if you shift one of them, because volume is shift invariant, those coefficients must be shift invariant. So this is a very, very essential property. It's also, can be shown that there is some monotonicity. So everything is convex. So this I even not, repeat, not repeating, but uh, if you have a convex body K belonging to a convex body L, then you have such a nice formula. Very good. Uh, also to show you more examples and understand and explain more how it works, let's agree that I will often substitute just the same things here. So if I repeat, if I repeat a coefficient in some, a, a convex body in the mixed volume, then I will just write it like this. It simply means that K is repeated N minus N times. So th those number in parentheses, it simply mean the repetition just to make it easier for people to type. Then for example, I mean, it's a more or less easy exercise. It's from here, from here. This, I don't think that it's so easy exercise, but from here it's, easy uh, deduce some nice binomial formulas. For example, if you take K and add to it T Euclidean ball here, it doesn't matter that it's Euclidean ball. You can take L if you want when you think about this exercise. Then you get this beautiful, nice polynomial with this binomial coefficients. And this formula 
simply follows from how many times you repeat the same thing here. So this is very simple formula. Okay, if you go with this formula and come back to our story about surface area to this formula, yes, then you plug this story in this formula, just directly plug it and get this. Okay, this is very nice. And I don't care again, because I'll take limit t goes to zero and I divide by t, I don't care about t square things. So I just took them like this. So k and k cancels out, uh, you divide and you get that this limit is just the first coefficient. So this is this coefficient multiplied by n. So this is a very direct calculation. So you see, we already add some meanings to the mixed volume. So we correct, connect them with the area of the convex body, which is very, very nice. And I'll again, we'll come back to this. So this is to give you an example, but this example will play quite a role. What I also need to remind you that there are absolutely beautiful and very nice inequalities about mixed volume, uh, about uh, volume. And the core inequality is so-called Brun-Minkowski inequality, which tells us that if you add to uh, everything should be measurable, but let can be just considered measurable in this case, or but let's do in a very basic thing and say that KNL are convex uh, compact sets. If you add them, then there is a beautiful inequality like this. Okay, uh, from this inequality, just playing a bit, just playing a bit with this, not so hard. For example, taking limits and so on you can prove so-called Minkowski inequality about this first coefficient that we discussed before. You can show that mixed volume of L just taken once and K take, taken N minus one times satisfies this beautiful inequality. I mean, why I call it beautiful? I mean, it's even not clear why those things are useful so far. So let, let's see, let's see. Okay, so let's glue it with what we discussed before. Let's glue it with what we discussed before. I proved to you almost, I mean, completely, one can say you need to play with it a bit, that surface area is equal to n times this mixed volume. But then I may apply our inequality that I just claimed to you and which I haven't proved, but which follows from Brun-Minkowski quite, I mean, easily. Then you get something like this about surface area. And now you can claim something absolutely cool because just using the area of a sphere formula, I mean, how it's connected to the volume of the ball, you get the what's written here, just the area of the sphere times the volume of the ball in correct power times volume of K in a correct power. And so you get this inequality. If you still don't feel that it's cool, then rewrite it, rewrite it, simply say that K has a volume as some ball of radius R. If you plug it here, you will get that if K has a volume as a ball of radius R, then the surface area of K is larger than the surface area of the sphere of radius R. And this is what we call isoperimetric inequality. So that's kind of one of the ways to use mixed volumes, which I, I mean, think quite, quite nice. So inequalities for mixed volumes, it's a very, very interesting area. So then, I mean, probably the most mighty among them, the coolest is so-called Alexander Fenkel inequality, which has, I mean, a lot, a lot of application and which is kind of can be seen above all those inequalities. It's a very cool inequality, very strong inequality. And actually, I mean, used to be with not so easy proof, but now there are some other proofs. I, I don't know, should I call them easy or not, but they're very, very analytic. So especially if you're interested in analysis in operator theory and stuff like this, I would strongly suggest you to check those proofs. They're very cool. And again, very, very analytic. As at first glance, something like this may not look very analytic, but th those proofs are extremely, I mean, core analysis. Very good. Uh, now, to again to say more about mixed volume before I will move to something new, but let me show you completely different connection to all of this to mixed volume. So it starts very, very strange and very, very kind of out of nothing. So 
uh, let me remind you, or as it would be in my case, tell me, because I didn't know about this before I talked to my friend with whom we studied back in university and who explained me a bit about algebraic geometry, just a bit, so I don't know much. Uh, the following story. So there is a very famous Bezu theorem, which tells us the following. You take polynomials, F1, Fn. Those are just polynomials, so nothing creative. I mean, they are polynomials. Uh, yes, as I said, polynomials. And what you define, you take Xi, Xi, those are poly, each of them a polynomials of n complex variables. So each of them is a polynomial of n complex complex variables and xi will be surfaces divided as the solutions of this polynomial. So very simple. Now to state the theorem, I just need to agree that when I intersect those polynomials, the, uh, sorry, when I intersect, when I say intersect polynomials, I clearly meant take a system. But I mean, when I intersect those hyper surfaces, I mean, the intersection is number, this is just a number of points in this intersection is not infinite. And it's easily can be infinite. I mean, this is this is clearly can be infinite. For example, not only, but for example, when we have F1, Fn has common factors. But you know what? In general, in the statement that I will make right now, for me, polynomials usually will be very generic. So they are not fixed, they're generic. I don't want to say words random, because it's very clever here. But I mean, polynomials are generic. So something like this in this series, kind of coincidence, which we right now don't care about. We don't study it. So this is something, I mean, which happens with measure zero. So we, we don't worry about it. So if this does not happen, if our polynomials in some way generic, then there is a beautiful fact that the number of solutions, the number of solutions of the systems or the number of intersection of those hypersurfaces is less or equal than the product of degrees of these polynomials. And so this is what's called Bezu theorem. I mean, for me, this is something absolutely strange, advanced, and very, very beautiful. So uh, let me show you very simple drawings that at least I can make. So if you take two ellipses, here's a picture. So degree is two. There are four points when they intersect. I mean, and clearly you can create two ellipses which just coincide, but this would make this story, yes? Okay, so this is this, is this beautiful theorem which has nothing to do with what I told you before. So I don't know why I'm telling it to you, but let's see. So uh, to continue with the story, I need to tell you what the Newton polytope. So this is again a very, very standard, very core thing, which is used in uh, algebraic geometry. So why not to discuss it? So Newton polytope of F, where F is a polynomial, is a convex whole of exponent vectors of polynomial F. So oh, very, very clever thing, but actually it's not. So here a polynomial, I just wrote it to you. If it's, it's of two variables, so my Newton uh, polytope would be in R2. So here my picture in R2. And now here, psychologically hard moment for me, I absolutely don't care about those numbers. So those numbers kind of random for me. You know, don't look at them. There are some random numbers. They appear there and good for them. Whom I care about, I care about those numbers, about powers. And so this is for me, seven, three. So this is point seven, three, here it is. This is for me, point five, five, here it is. This is for me, point six, zero, here it is. And so on. And this is for me, by the way, point zero, zero. So I take, I put those, literally put those exponents in the grid. So the all vertices are integer numbers. So it's an integer polytope and I connect it. And by the way, if you notice, some of them I get eaten because I take a convex hole. So some of those guys I get eaten and you get a lot of new ones. So that's what's called Newton polytope. So very, very nice thing. Uh, for example, let me also show to you that if we take the most simple case, which turns out to be essential for me, it's it, it just in a fine polynomial. So I mean, plane geometrically, then as a, polytope, Newton polytope, you get simplex. 
sorry, simplex. Wow, I think it's very cool. So it's it just a simplex, yes, because this is one zero, this is zero one. And I mean, if I have more variables, it's, it's simplex and it's this simplest simplex, if one can say it sounds very weird, but it is. Okay, so why, why, why all of this is interesting? Because there is this absolutely amazing theorem, which I mean, has millions of proofs. And I mean, it's, part of it was for, first proved by Bernstein, after there is uh, proved by Kushnirenko, there is a, also a lot of de development done by Havansky. So this is from algebraic geometry, which tell us the following, and it glues all of it together. So let F1, Fn be polynomial with fixed Newton polytope. So we fix those exponential vectors. You remember, that's what I'm care about. And generic coefficient. So there is a chance of some coincidence, but let's forget about this chance of coincidence. Then if I count the number of solution of the system, taking out all zeros, I will explain to you the story that I don't take zeros. Then miracle of miracles happens. It's equal n factorial times mixed volume of this Newton polynomials, which is absolutely strange. I mean, look, so to count this, just to count the number of solution, you can use this weird thing, which called mixed volume. It comes, pumps out of more or less nothing, nothing. It's, it's very, very cool. Just to explain you this zero, why, why you really need to fix something. It just remembers that if I take this triangle and start moving it around, it's more or less multiplying those coefficients by different powers of X and Y and this too. So multiplying all of this by x to power 10, y to power 17. I will still get a triangle, but somewhere there. The number of solutions will change, but the volume of triangle and all other mixed volumes will not change. That's why we don't count zero. We count zeros. We kind of keep it, the uh, polynom uh, polynomials fixed. Okay, so this is kind of babyish explanation why you need to deal with what's called torus. But I mean, you don't need those very, very bright names. I think this is very nice. Okay, but again, what it has to do with us? Because unbelievably, so this is convex geometry gives a present to algebraic geometry. But unbelievably, you can play with this backwards now. Look what we can do. So actually to compute a degree, of a given polynomial, you can also, so this is again a bit of algebraic geometry or just simple thing. So quadratic equation, if you intersect it with generic one line, it has two roots. I mean, there is a coincidence when it has a one root and we are talking about complex number, but in general, it has a two roots. So to compute, to compute the number of, uh, to compute the degree of a polynomial, you can intersect it with a generic line. So degree of polynomials is a number of intersection. Yes, so with a generic line, but how we can create a generic line? I mean, it's actually a bit tough to create it with equation. Instead of creating generic line with equation, let me think about it just as an intersection of a number of planes, yes? so. A line in three dimensions is the intersection of two planes. So instead of writing generic line, I will write that it's the intersection of n minus one planes. Yes, where I mean this is generic affine. So when I write like this to define a plane, this is just a generic affine function. So this is look very, very tough, very, very strange. But now let's see what I'm claiming the degree of polynomial. If I use the theorem of uh, uh, this uh, Bernstein, Kushnirenko, Havansky, what can I write? This is n factorial, mixed volume, and so this is a polyno a, a, a Newton polytope which goes to my beautiful polynomial f i. But each of those planes actually corresponds to a simplex, as we checked. So I just need to take a simplex n minus one times. And this is a degree. This is a degree. So this is a formula how you can compute the degree of generic 
uh, polynomial using mixed volume, which is again very, very strange. So now, now let me glue it all together. So this is formula for Bezus. This is Bezus here. This is this algebraic geometry formula. This is another algebraic geometry formula. So putting this just together, so substituting those guys into this inequality, we get this, which is nice, but not clear what is it yet. Now, noticing that a simplex, this one, has volume just one over n factorial, you can put simplex back here. And now noticing that actually any of those polynomials, I say polynomials because I'm thinking about fi polytops can also be simplices. You can simply say the following, that taking them in not n, but r times, so this is have here power from one, uh, product from one to r, repetitions here r minus one. And now those were any, in some way, any polynomials you want, I mean, they was with integer coefficient, but any polynomial with integer coefficient, you can approximate with not integer coefficient, you can approximate by polynomial with integer coefficient when you're allowed to shrink and do the stuff. So what we actually find out, the following, forgetting now about algebraic geometry, beautiful inequality for mixed volume and a simplex. So the point about this inequality, not how to prove it, because actually, there is a way to prove it directly using conic geometry, but to figure it out. So just to find something to prove, it turns out that those things from algebraic geometry can inspire you and suggest you a number of very, very cool inequalities that uh, may be useful in, in conic geometry. And I will show you how they're useful. And that's why we come back to some sets in a second. Also, Actually, this inequality creates two very nice questions, which now has nothing to do with my algebraic geometry discussion. So as you remember, I claimed that here is a simplex, but now a question, can we put anything else, but not the simplex? Or you can apply linear transformation. So to, because um, mixed volumes acts like a volume very nicely with a linear transformation. So actually here you can put any simplex you want. And that's why I'm writing it like this. But can you put something else? So in other words, if I have a convex body D which satisfy this inequality for any test sets K1, KR, does D must be a simplex? So this is kind of offside note because in convex geometry, there are many questions which are asking to characterize a simplex. So it's a nice question to try to characterize a simplex using inequality for mixed volumes. And actually it turns out to be that the answer is yes in dimension two and three. And I was able to do it with my friends, Ivan Sopranov and Chris Saroglu. But in general, starting from uh, dimension four, this I don't know. So this is something that, that I'm trying to do and but absolutely without any luck to show that such inequalities can characterize a simplex starting from dimension four. So this is the first thing that one can ask. Uh, another thing that one can ask is the following. So we know that this is true for the simplex. Now in convex geometry, there is this, always this question can you now put here any other body? But I mean, definitely we checked it and the answer is no, because if you can, then this question about characterization of simplex would not make any sense. So we haven't found anything that you can put there, but not a simplex and have constant one. This we haven't found, but can you, you know, now, you know, as adults, you know that nothing in life happens for free. So the question like this, can you put here another convex body and pay just a bit and pay a constant. So the answer, if you kind of know the tricks and the functional analysis of convex geometry, the answer is immediately yes, because there is a, there is a beautiful John theory, which tell us that any convex body can be approximated by ellipsoid with the error, multiplicative error N. 
And so, I mean, simplex is a convex body. And so then repeating this trick, you can approximate simplex, uh, any convex body by a simplex paying n square. By the way, you can do better than n square, but this is, then I need to claim some theorems that I don't want to do it now because it does not happen, helps to this constant. So, but I mean, what you get is n square. And so like this, you can get some very, very bad constant. So yes, this inequality can work with a very bad constant. And the question is, I mean, what is the best constant? And there is another question, which you, because you're very nice to me, you're not asking, why is it interesting to find a best constant for something like this? This is a good question and I will try to answer it. But for me, it's just interested, interesting like this. So it's always good. But let's, if you didn't be, believe in both this story about algebraic geometry, if you didn't bought the story that mixed volumes is essential, let's see more. So let me like this by projection on Xi perp of D did not an orthogonal projection of a D of a convex body D to a hyperplane. So here hyperplane, psi perp, and here just psi, this is a picture, uh, to a hyperplane with a normal vector psi. So this is a notation. Then it turns out again, mixed volumes can be used to produce a formula. There is also a Cauchy formula, but I prefer to use a mixed volume to produce a formula of the volume of orthogonal projections. How you do it? Take a unit segment from zero to psi, and then notice that if you have D, again, let me do two dimensional picture. You know, it's a seminar, we all friends, so I, I don't need to be very precise. And the whole point is just to know idea. Take D and add to it, just add to it. T, T will go to zero, T, times the segment. So this is a segment zero psi of dimension, uh, or, or, or t segment zero psi of uh, uh, length one. Yeah, so it's of length t times length one, so of length t, I add it. So then what happens? Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. I kind of, you know, do it like this. So that's my segment. And if you play with this a little bit, it looks like you simply insert a parallelogram inside it. But then, I mean, what is the height here? What is the height of this parallelogram? The height of this problem, you see, I, I was denoting projection slightly different before, so I, I cut it from the pictures that I did. The height is exactly projection onto psi perp of D. So the height here is exactly projection of psi perp on, on D. So this is my height. I will do it once, we'll not do it again. And so you can see that this sum is just D. Here is my D, area of D plus T times the, I mean, length of projection, but you can repeat it all in dimension N. So you get this formula. Now, what you do, you take you take again your memory about uh, polynomial representation of the volume that this can be written as d plus the first coefficient that we actually computed with you t plus t squared. But I mean, those are the same polynomials. Come on. So this must be just this coefficient must be just that, just this. And all of this is zero, by the way. So you created a very, very, very nice formula for projections. It's projection is just a mixed volume with an interval. And by the way, you can iterate. Oh, yeah, it stops. Sorry. Sorry. It stops. Uh, uh, I will. Hold it again. Hold it again. It will work. Okay. It will definitely work. Yes. Okay. So you created a very, very cool formula yeah, for projection. Okay. And okay. now you, you can iterate it. Perfect. And I mean, without my help, create even more cool formula for projection of higher co-dimension, which is, I mean, this is 
I, I mean, like a Cauchy formula, very famous, as probably some of you learned school, but this is already very useful and very nice. So now why I'm saying that it's very nice, let's go back to those inequalities about uh, mixed volumes that I told you, these inequalities inspired by algebraic geometry. So this is also inequalities. What you can do, you can plug there for those body just segments. You can plug just segments. And what you will see, so that this guy becomes the volume of the projection. This guy becomes the volume of the projection. And this guy becomes the volume of the projection. So all together, after just direct substitution of K1, K2, to be segments, you see that what you actually try to study, I mean, you need to correct coefficients, is the following inequality for projection. So, I mean, if you're trying to generate it, not for a, a simplex, but for something else, that's what you are asking. Is the following inequality for projection is true? And now this becomes, for some people, even more interesting and natural. And it turns out very, 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 very cool thing which is, I mean, amazing that it's coincide with the story about mixed volumes and the story that comes from this Bizu theorem. Okay? So th that's what I was saying, that we connected this to inequality for projections. And now it turns out that those inequalities were studied a lot, a lot. For example, Giannopoulos, Herzalaki, and Paoris, they proved that for any body D, for any body D, for simply any body D, if you pay a bit, if you put here number two and not number one, then you will have such an inequality. Okay. Actually, from here now, you can jump back. You can jump back. How you can jump back? Because you can rewrite this guy, this guy. This is an idea, and I will explain you what to do again in segments. So this is segment, this is segment. This is segment and this is segment. And you remember we discussed that mixed volumes are linear with respect to one element. And so you can start adding those inequalities, adding those segments. And when you add them, you come to use something very, very popular in geometry, which so called zonotops or, or zonoid. So zonoid is just a limit of zonotops. And so what is a zonotope? It's a simply a sum of segments. For example, this square, as we discussed, is a sum of those segments. So it's a zonotope. Or this uh, rectangle is a sum of those two segments. So it's a zonotope. But this guy is also zonotope because it's sum of those segments that I draw. And even this guy, no, it's not a zonotope, but it's a zonoid. It takes a bit of calculation to show that it's a limit. And there are many, many, many other things. For example, any unit ball for P greater or equal than two is a zonoid. So it's a very interesting and nice class of convex bodies. And actually any symmetric convex body in two dimensional space is a zonoid. So, I mean, I, I show you more example of these guys. Let me show you more examples of these guys. Let me also make a remark that there are guys which are not zonotopes. For example, a unit ball of L1, so-called cross polytope, is not a zonotope. You can see it here because it has a triangles and it cannot be written as a sum actually. Okay, so this is a bit of story. So adding, adding this, adding this thing, coming back, as I told you, using the mixed volume multilinear, multi you will be able to prove, for example, just from this theorem, just from this theorem, you can prove the following statement about mixed volumes, the following Bizu inequality, if Z1 is Z2 are zonoids. So D is anything, but if Z1 and Z2 are zonoids, you are able to prove something like this. And actually, you can use more and more inequalities for projection to create more interesting inequalities of those types. So for example, we with Ivan were able to prove such inequality for projections, which is very, very nice inequality, and thus prove the following inequality for mixed volumes, 
which is again here we use not only to, but a few zonoids. Now there is a very, very cool, uh, I, I explain how you add it up, but I, it's again stop. I'm not my lucky day. Share screen. There are more interesting inequalities for projections. And stop because it doesn't like you. Uh, very interesting inequalities yeah. for projections creating by our friends who are here by David. So she is not here, Bernardo, Hugo, and Rafa. And so it's a very, very nice inequality for projections, which you can even more generalize and create even more interesting inequalities for mixed volumes and zanoids here. And D can be any convex body. So it's a very, very lively subject and you can do many things. But let me for a second kind of depart it and still show you that it be connected to something completely different in a very quirky way, okay? So let me run it over because we don't have a time and I don't wanna, I wanna talk about something even more interesting. Uh, in the, some recent years, like 15, 12 years, there is a move of moving some inequality from inequalities from information theory to convex geometry. By moving, I mean, in, you look to inequality in, in information theory, you get inspired and you create an inequality in convex geometry. And so, may, I mean, some of the people who were doing it, it's Sergei Babkov and Makshay Madima. So they created some technique of how to do it, which is very smooth, very nice, and produce a lot of very interesting inequalities. So I, I actually love them. And this is, can be separate talk to talk about them. One of the inequalities that they offer is like this. It's look very strange, absolutely not clear when it's, when it comes for people working in the convex geometry. So let A be a fixed convex body, and you take as many bodies as you want, and you take A to power M minus one, you add those guys like this, then there is the following bound. So this inequality was proved, I don't remember, like 10 years ago, and then again, it's uses just tools from information theory. Very, very nice inequality. Uh, what is interesting is that, as I said, there are millions, millions of inequalities that you can produce like this, which turns out to be very useful. I will try to explain why. And they are also kind of create, turned out also to be related to so-called additive combinatorics. I mean, to the whole theory of how to compute uh, how integer points behave under Minkowski sum. So Plunke ruja inequalities. Uh, I mean, again, this is something very, very deep. So this is one of them. So if you try to calculate the number of integer points in something like this, you take sets. So you take uh, sets A, set B1, BK. So it should remind you very much this. So it's not clear why they look absolutely the same. So take sets A, B1, BK, and the finite set, uh, say, say in RD, so don't worry about this commutative group. And you say that number of points in A plus BI is just some multiple of the number of points in A. And you take any X inside A, then there is such inequality. But it should immediately remind you what's written here. You just, I mean, do correct cancellation. The only thing that there is no this constant, which is, I mean, make a question, should we have this constant uh, in the big inequality? Is this needed? Excuse me. So, uh, yes. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, I guess this Babkov Madiman inequality is not, okay, the proof is, hmm. It's independent from what you showed us before. When when you show us the definition of mixed volumes and you uh, is the volume of some addition of some convex bodies and Fengen inequalities, etc. So the proof of this one, I guess it's unrelated to the proof of Alessandro Fengel type inequalities. Very good. It I, used to be unrelated. Uh, sorry, I cannot go. It used to be unrelated. Okay. Can you hear what I said? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, yeah. Okay. I mean, original proof 
they take an inequality for uh, from information theory. They use this, their tools and they get it. I, I mean, I I will not explain how they prove it because I, I want to show you. Okay, okay, yeah, sure. What I did, but I will. I will. It's a very good question that you're asking. So originally, no. Okay, so for example, for example, if you just take the simple case of M uh, equal two, so just two three bodies. So A, it's always there. B one and B two, you get something like this. You get something like this. Very good. Now, the question that I was just asked in some way is three to the n sharp, and the way how it's proved actually is the following. Babkov and Madiman paid. They pay this guy exactly to use information theory. So their idea to use it ex exactly, I mean, this is what you need to pay. Okay, very good. So let me move through this. This is not nice. And let me actually answer this question. So how one can approach it and what is known? So actually what you can do, you can improve this constant quite a bit. So if you ask for this constant, when it is the best, uh, what you can do with it. So le let me show you, let me show you. And I will actually, I mean, I will take a few more minutes and I will show you how you can do it. There, there is a number of questions that you can ask. So the first question is, can you improve it in general? The second question, for example, another person from information Syria asked Tom Cordar, if you can improve it for some convex bodies. For example, when uh, one of convex bodies is a Euclidean ball, or you can improve it for some classes of convex bodies. So what turns out is that this constant you can improve. So in dimension two, it's just one. Uh, in dimension three, you can also find a constant for thirds. And I mean, in dimension n, you can improve it like this, but this is not best possible. Uh, for some particular cases, when it's Euclidean ball and one of the bodies is Zanoid, you can improve it big time. You can make it one. Uh, when one of the bodies is a simplex, you can also make it one, but only in dimension two, three, and four. Two is not so interesting, but three and four is very interesting. And I mean, some of it, some parts of it was also noticed by Piotr Nayar and Thomas Coach, especially, I mean, what was noticed is this lower bound, but other parts, they're very dependent to the stories that we discussed before. And so this is much more fresh and interesting. So let me just try to explain to you in uh, five minutes how you can do it. So you do the following, you, you, do, you go to mix volumes, that's the whole point. So I'm trying to find the best constant in such inequality, for example, very good. Uh, write A plus B plus C in mixed volumes. And I mean, it looks tough, but this is just a mixed volume formula. And this is just combinatorics, which counts your repetition of this coefficient. So this is very easy. And actually when I write it, it's much easier to rewrite it as a two sums like this. Uh, write this in a mixed volume and that I already did. I did it with T for you, but here I done it without T and simply take a product. So take a product of this sum and that sum. That's directly what's written here. And now do something ridiculous. I mean, actually the only thing that I know how to do, compare this and that term by term, just like this, stupidly, term by term. I know that when you deal with a sum, it's not the best idea, but I mean, there is something to it. If you add here T, if you add here T and play with the T, you get the feeling that that's the best that you can do. In any case, that's what we can do. When you compare, you get the following dream. You want to prove such inequalities. Written here, simply this divided by that, nothing more, with the best possible constant Cn. And you want Cn to be independent of anything, of J, M, and everything. So rewriting this, just doing simple binomial coefficients that you know from very beginning, you get this. And now, so to improve this inequalities, it's come from us from information theory, you really want to do this. So this is not, it's a very good point that you asked me about Alexander Fenkel. It's not Alexander Fenkel, it's reverse. So this is, or how it's sometimes called local Alexander Fenkel. 
or how I call it, because I mean, we came to it from algebraic geometry part, Bizu inequality. So this is those Bizu inequalities. The whole story about them comes to be useful here again. And so here they are. So to improve a constant you want uh, to solve this inequality, you want to find the best constant here. And as I just told you that this is our friend. And actually when M is equal to zero, J is equal to zero, this is the simplest of them, which is just trivial. It's just equality. So you don't need CN at all. Just substitute, you will see. But in all other cases, this is what we call Bizu inequality, this old friend. Uh, for example, when n equal to uh, m, sorry, m equal j equal one, you get simply this guy, and you're trying to find the best constant for it. And I mean, the best constant for it turns out to be c2 equal one, which was done by many people in many different ways. It's a very strange inequality, but very beautiful. And in general, many people, so here I made the list now contributed to the best constant constant to these types of inequalities. And if you study their works, you can actually get this best constant to these inequalities, in, uh, which were inspired by um, uh, information series. So that's how you get best constant in those inequalities. Very good. Okay. Uh, yes, so this I said, and I mean, again, the feeling is that all of this suggests that Bizu inequality may have more use. So let me use, I, I see that already two minutes late, but let me use two more minutes to explain to you why. So uh, if it's okay, I will not tell you the lower bound, how you get the lower bound, but I will give you a hint. For the low bound, you notice that the constant has a product structure. This is very easy because the inequality has a product structure because the volume has no power. So here you can take a product. And after you go to miracle, to our story of the projections, and you find out that this inequality is equivalent to the inequality of the projections. And for inequalities for the projection, the best story, uh, so the best, it was shown that inequality for projections is sharp. It was shown by Fredelisi, Gianopolis, and Meyer. And so that's how you show that the lower bound and you suggest the sharp constant in such inequalities. So th that's a point. Okay, this is a story about projection. It's not nice to go over it. And so studying these inequalities together with Fredelisi, Madiman, and Meyer, we actually notice that they are all equivalent. So if you have a dream in this inequality for three bodies to get one, then it turns out you should have a dream to inequality for Bizu to have this special constant, which is in general impossible as we found out for projections. This is definitely impossible in general. When it's actually impossible when A is a, a L1 ball, so cross pol polytop. So this is impossible. Okay, actually, if you allow those bodies for, for which you have a dream to have more properties. So here, we only wanted to have a sums and deletions. But if you allow transformations, then you can show that it's equivalent to more story. For example, it's equivalent to such unbelievable inequality for projections in surface area. In some way, that surface area ratio increase when you take orthogonal projection. And I mean, again, in general, this should be wrong. But if one of those inequalities is true, this would be true. Or for this inequality for projections, which is absolutely amazing. And this is just a payment that I take orthogonal uh, vectors. And so inequality for projections true without any number two, something like this. Or this is equivalent. Again, I wrote to the same inequality. I just wanted to connect those two pictures. Or actually, it's an equivalent to the following statement, very strange, that such a polynomial, when you take a volume of A plus T plus a parallelogram, just a parallelogram, has only real roots. And again, this is not true for all A. But if any of those is true, this would also be true. So we kind of was able to prove this equivalence and this equivalence. And if you consider both classes, 
then it's all become equivalent. But clearly, I mean, you want to see something when it's actually true. And what was kind of absolutely amazing that we were able to show that if you fix the class of zonoids, if you fix the class of zonoids, then all, all those properties become absolutely true. And so, for example, this Bizu theorem becomes true with unbelievable constant. And I beg you, beg you to see that before I was discussing and the constant was different when those guys are zonoids and this is anything. Here, it's absolutely essential for me that A is zonoid. And to prove something like this, it's a bit tough because behavior here on A is not linear at all. So th this is quite, I mean, something that one can be proud of. So we are proud of. So it turns out that all of these properties is true for zonoids. Moreover, even such inequality is true for zonoids. Ah. And I stop it. Sorry. I will do it with some kind of. Yes, yes. Very good. Even this cool inequality okay. is true for zonoids. So, yes. So, and let me just finish that taking this. You remember I had this inequality by Babkov and Madiman. You can iterate it and get that this inequality, if all bodies are zonoids, is just true without any constant, which is quite cool. Okay, so I'm terribly sorry for taking more time. Thank you so much. Not at all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Artem, for this presentation of all these equivalent ways of seeing the problem. So if there are any questions or comments, you can unmute yourself and ask. Hey, I have a question in the uh, in the beginning of the um, relation between polynomial degrees and uh, okay oh, the, the case of the simplex appears uh, related to the to the case of affine functions right on, on one side you have simplexes yes because and on the other side because you have simplex a, it's a, for affine function Newton poly, polytope is a simplex yes Yes, in the very beginning of the. Yes, yes, yes. I'm going to. Okay. I'm sorry. Yes. So, um, I don't know if it has any meaning. Uh, what is the. Let's suppose polynomials of degree two, do they give a comprehensive set easy to describe? Uh, so, the polynomials of degree side? two, I mean, so it's. Or is it already too complicated? No, 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 no. Let me, I'm sorry. I want to go to the grid. Oh, it's, it's, uh, I probably need to be more advanced. I'm sorry. I, here, 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 here. I will be faster and I will show to you. I will answer it. So you, you're asking the first question. Okay. So if you're, you're saying like this, take X, Y plus X square. Uh, plus y square, yes, plus seven. So then I fix this point, I fix this point, and then I, so this is one, one. Yes, so this is. Yes, so here, here, as you can see, I will also, if I take this, I get something like that, which is not nice because I, it's also look like simplex. So let me just do. So it's, you, you know, is, is a, if I take something like this, so I will not take y square. I'll get this guy. So it's, it depends what, what you mean by easy to describe. But I mean, there are di different types. So they are not so necessarily beautiful as simplex. Yeah, what, what I, okay, I, I realize. Uh, so it's not a natural. No, I mean, no, no, no. I mean, you get a collection of polytopes, but uh, not, uh, okay, I see, I see. So it's, it's, it's different, you know, whatever integer 
think you will get to me, it will correspond to something. Yes, you just take those vertices. And I mean, actually you can take something inside. So I, it was simplex with a size one, but if I take a side one, but if I take a simplex of a different side, yes, uh, it yes, can yes, correspond yes. to a different polynomial. So it's, it's a, uh, but it's a quite kind of very, very quirky way to do it. So the first thing was done by Berstein, Berstein, yes. I should probably say, actually in Russian going to be Berstein, so he's from uh, Soviet Union. So the idea was to calculate just a number of solution of one equation, and right. then you use volume. But after, I mean, not Berstein, it was done by Kushnirenko, and after Berstein noticed that you can do systems and have mixed volume. So, you know, it was very strange to me when I was told about this, and I found out that I never learned about this in convex geometry, but this is for them, for algebraic geometry, it's kind of classical fact. Okay. That they use all the time those Birstein, Kushnirenko, Havansky theory. Yeah, okay, okay, thanks, yeah. Okay, any other questions or comments? No, I do have a question. Uh, you talked about this inequality for projections where you were projecting yes. hyperplanes and an n minus two dimensional subspace. Yes. Right. And you talked and about that if we take inequalities that you produced, you yeah. can have even more nicer, more variety of those guys. And I again need to jump to that slide. Yes. Yeah, and the, for sonoids, the constant is improved and there's all the equivalents with the other inequalities for- so, But you, you see, for, so th that's a point. So in, uh, I'm, I'm trying to open this to make it more clear because this is a, so if you look here in this inequality, yes, question we get, yeah. let, let me open where here, here, so- yeah. One of the essential things that's first of all, this is a very nice inequality and inequality that you also produced. This inequality is very nice, but it is sharp as follows uh, from uh, cross polytop example, what uh, um, Fredelisi, Gianopoulos, yeah. years, this one. But I, I think your inequality is also absolutely sharp. If I'm right, it's also L1 ball, yes? I mean, I, uh, yes. So, but, but what is sharp? But what is essential that in this inequality, I'm not. We are not fixing D to be a zonoid. So the right. claims that I made in Z that if we fix D, so you see, even here I made it any. If you fix D to be zonoid, which cuts out, for example, L1 ball, then you can remove this too. Yes. So. Uh, what I wanted to ask is if instead of taking hyperplanes, you project onto subspaces of other dimension. Yes, you can iterate and constant also will improve. Yes. Yeah, so you can also improve the inequality for sonics. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, there's also equivalence with some of the results for mixed volumes or. Results. So, because I mean, I didn't write it here. If you take your inequality for zonoids, so, no, so if you take your inequality for projections, I mean, you again can you understand how from here you get here? You just more or less you write this, this guy, you literally go back, you write it as a mixed volume with the correct coefficient of yep. D and zero psi. And then you can integrate over Xi yeah. because uh, mixed volume is uh, uh, multilinear. Mm -hmm. This is the whole how to go from here back to mixed volumes. So from inequalities that you have, even without talking about zonoids, you can produce quite a number of nice inequalities for mixed volumes uh, when K1, K2, KR are zonoids. There are whole different things that you can produce. Does it make sense? Yeah.
outing. Okay, any other questions, comments? No, if not, thanks again, Artem. And You're very, very stop recording now.